Um, our next speaker um, who flew from um, Vienna to come and uh, speak, give a, give a talk here, has a very interesting background because um, he, um, he started with uh, studying uh, medicine and as a medical student uh, got interested in uh, IT technology and um, have been doing uh, some pretty amazing things in this area. And uh, now uh, he will be talking about um, he will be talking about their invention and how you can empower an enterprise with uh, language intelligence. Let's welcome uh, Francisco Weber. Uh, hello, uh, I'm glad to be here. Uh, was uh, quite I mean Vienna is pretty close to Munich, so uh, I was kind of relaxed today in the morning, but. Uh, then over the day, I had like 25 things that tried to prevent me of coming here. So I'm really, uh, so like flights that get canceled and the purses that uh, were left in the taxi and things like that. So, but I'm here with my purse, with my computer. So <laughs> I'm glad this turned out like this. Um, yeah, so I, um, I I gave this talk already in, uh, in, in the data economy community a couple of times. Uh, I decided to slightly change the title, so traditionally I uh, called it uh, democratizing NLP. Uh, so the content is still the same, uh, but now I wanted to promote more the concept of language intelligence uh, because we are somehow in the middle between natural language processing and uh, artificial intelligence in a strange way, uh, as you will see, but uh, still. Uh, so I will... Um, simply start uh, telling you the story. So we are um, um, a startup. We started about end of 2011. Uh, we, we actually started uh, the company initially. The whole thing started as a research project. Uh, it was, um, I would say, a, a more naive approach on uh, how would it be possible to natively uh, feed text into neural networks. Yeah, so this used to be a very tough problems because you know neural networks uh, they can accept numbers easily uh, but as soon as you come up with some symbolic information that's definitely not what they expect so you have to do something with the text uh, in order to uh, have a neural network uh, to, to, to empower the neural network to actually learn something about it. So we had a, a theory, a very early theory that was uh, based on findings in neuroscience so we wanted to do something really different so not the whole statistic stuff again uh, we wanted to do the whole thing without statistics and i, I will show you uh, uh, the approach we took um, yeah and uh, the results of the research project that was about mid uh, 2012 uh, were much better than even us, uh, being, so to say, the very optimistic researchers. Uh, it was even better than we had expected in the first place, and that was basically the reason we said, okay, we have to bring this to market, we have to expose this, uh, so that people start really doing, uh, solving problems with this, so that we actually see where it makes sense to further uh, refine and develop uh, the technology. Okay, uh, the link to big to big data is basically uh, the fact that a large amount of big data is actually big text data. Uh, there are not so many people um, speaking about this uh, in, 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 a, in a precise manner. Uh, everybody talks about big data, but you know, uh, big number data is, uh, you treat it differently from uh, big text data. And uh, the other thing is that our current tool set to process text is not yet at a point that you can really sort of pipe uh, terabytes or petabytes even uh, through those mm -hmm. engines. So there is a lot to do on this side. And um, I, I will propose uh, the approach of sort of making this easier at some point. And again, the fundamental problem uh, we deal here with statistical, uh, with symbolic information. And because it's symbolic, uh, we have to do something with the data before we can actually feed it into whatever algorithm. And what we typically do is statistics. Um, and we do this already for so long time, for about 30, 40 years maybe even, um, that uh, many of the people working in the field have forgotten that there could be another approach than counting the words and inferring statistics on them. 
So the problems of those uh, traditional systems is if you want to create a good NLP system, it's really hard. Yeah? Uh, it's hard to build because you have to sort of uh, use a lot of uh, uh, theory, a lot of different concepts uh, of approaches where you have to know how they behave in practice. Um, it's also problematic because if you just use the brute force statistics, it tends to be a little bit uh, imprecise. So a human uh, is very, humans are very um, sensitive to the use of language. So a slight change in language or in vocabulary already makes uh, people laugh or even angry sometimes. So uh, that's a, a big problem to do this uh, on, on a very good uh, quality level. Um, it tends to be expensive because you need a lot of experts and they need to do a lot of their work in a trial and error situation mm -hmm. because you cannot really predict how a system, uh, a complex system in NLP will behave in practice. You have to try it out most, most, uh, uh, most uh, times. And then you have the problem whenever you got your system built, uh, in order to maintain it, uh, you have a lot of work to do because uh, uh, language changes over time, your data changes over time, some categories that you might have created are not accurate enough. So you have to sort of uh, continuously improve it and, and maintain it. Um, the alternative that we propose, uh, we call that um, semantic fingerprinting. That's, yeah, yes? There are some specific examples of analogies like what's used for um, yeah, okay, I, I can give you examples. I mean, the, the most obvious one uh, is searching. So if you want to search through a collection of uh, documents, for example, or, or web pages, uh, what you fundamentally use is uh, natural language processing to basically prepare the data in a way that it becomes searchable. Um, other, other approach is uh, finding out, uh, let's say, in uh, uh, one year worth uh, of tweets, uh, how a certain brand um, is treated. Yeah? So you want your, if you are a, a, a company that produces mobile phones and you want to find out uh, are people talking about us and what are they saying about us uh, and you can mine in large uh, social network text collections or whatever as, a, as an example. But basically whenever you want to trigger business uh, decisions based on some natural language by what means ever. It can, can be a message by mail, it can be, a, 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 I don't know, a tweet, for example, a, a news message that comes in from a news feed. Whenever you want software to make a decision based on what the content is of this text, then you apply mm -hmm. natural language processing. So you cut the text in little pieces, in words, in sentences. Uh, you, you look up uh, for what do the words mean? So, for example, you might have dictionaries uh, to figure out uh, what topics uh, are in, in a certain piece of text and so on. But basically, wherever you see human-produced or human-readable text, uh, you need these techniques, basically, to get the information out of it. Um, yeah, and the big problem is to actually find out what a piece of text means uh, and uh, to try and come as close to the perception of the meaning uh, as, as humans do because uh, very often we want to uh, take away uh, the decision-making process from a human and we want to automate it for example if there is a lot of data coming in and you don't want to have 500 people reading emails just to react on that uh, things like that, um, there you need to find out what a certain piece of text uh, is actually about. Um, and as I said, the, the traditional approach is basically counting the words that you find uh, in the text and then creating statistics like uh, how often does a word appear in my document, how often does it appear in the whole collection, and then there are a set of, of, of uh, standard uh, uh, formulas that allow you to get a, a good guess on which are the important words and how do I cluster the information um, accordingly. Our system, uh, as I said, creates semantic fingerprints and those semantic fingerprints have one main purpose. They want to represent the meaning of the text as a numerical value. So uh, you create a semantic fingerprint of two pieces of text 
And by comparing them, and, and when I say compare, it's actually numerically comparing them, calculating something like a Euclidean distance uh, between the two, uh, you, get, you can get a glimpse on how related mm -hmm. they are. Um, oops. Uh, so here you see uh, four uh, semantic fingerprints of words. That's uh, where we start in the first step. What we do is that we create a, a vocabulary that we train on some collection of real text. Uh, and each word that appears there uh, will be mapped into another representation that you can see here uh, as, a, as a graphical bitmap. In fact, uh, every word is represented by a binary vector uh, of lengths, in our case here, uh, 16,000 bits, where each bit of the representation corresponds to a certain context that the word was used in. So just as a, as a comparison, how do we learn language? Uh, we just hear people talk when we are babies. We don't understand anything. We, certain words appear more and more often. Uh, we start storing the, 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 how they sound, so to say. And we learn in what situations do I hear this word? And what are the other words that come together with the word? And basically what we do is that uh, we take up, uh, we call them utterances, uh, uh, in a more theoretical approach, I call them special case experiences, because this is a specific formulation that I hear at a specific moment in time, and I store it. And every time I hear a sentence or, uh, or an utterance of, of someone, I store it. And whenever I store it, I try to arrange um, the common topics that I can find out uh, to stay close together. And those topics that are not so related, I put them more far away. And that's exactly what happens here uh, in this representation. So the, the binary representation of the word is for every bit uh, that I use there, it's a context in which I've, so to say, uh, registered the word. And the position on where they are depends on the topic. So there are these two processes, basically, uh, some sort of mapping of the concepts that occurs over time. The more material I hear, the more complete my map becomes. And then for every word, I just light up the <laughs> context in which the word occurred. And what I get is a distributed representation, <clears throat> the representation that on one hand, uh, corresponds to some theoretical work in LNP that specifically says that the definition of words in general, for humans even, uh, it is done by a distributed representation of our perception of the words. Uh, and the other thing, and there it uh, links to the neuroscience part of our work, is that um, neuroscience research basically uh, came up with the concept that every data that uh, reaches our cortex, regardless if it's from hearing, if it's from seeing, from, from touch, uh, uh, the data is always represented as a distributed binary large vector, so to say. This is called an SDR, a sparse distributed representation. So it's pretty tough to, to pronounce, but what it says is, first of all, that it's binary, so there are no floating point numbers anywhere. Uh, which directly um, uh, tells you that the processing of these numbers is pretty effective. That's the reason why, why it's binary. Um, the other thing, it's a, it's a huge vector, so a lot of bits. So we use 16,000, but this is compared to the biological representation rather small, but still it's much bigger uh, than traditional uh, document vectors or word vectors that are used uh, in NLP. And what is very important is that each of the vectors has to be filled in a very sparse manner. The point is that a sparse vector, as a, so to say, mathematical entity, behaves very differently from a dense vector uh, in, in one very important aspect. If you have, let's say, three dense vectors, uh, an example would be ASCII codes. Yeah, so ASCII codes are vectors of 8-bit. And every bit, so to say, uh, makes a big change if you flip it. it. Basically gives you another character. If you take three of those vectors and you order them together, what you get out of that is whatever, it's a mess. It has nothing to do with the information you had initially. If you take a sparse vector where you have like one, two percent of the 
of the positions filled with ones only, you can actually order them together and you don't lose information. You get more complete information. You have then, let's say, 3% fill grade, but all the semantic features that you had initially in your first vector are still contained in the resulting vector. And that's a very fundamental um, difference where our technology basically rela re relays on this. So I don't know who was first. <laughs> Please. Um, is there a, a 2D um, neighborhood there, or is it just for Absolutely. For so, uh, as I said, um, the process of creating this representation is two, two steps. In the first step, we do what we call uh, the semantic folding. So the goal there is to fold in the semantics of the whole representational universe I want to use into every single representation of a word. So what we do is we take uh, a collection of text. In our case, uh, this one we have done with uh, Wikipedia. Uh, we take uh, 400,000 Wikipedia documents. We cut them in little pieces so that every topic is contained in one piece and every piece only contains one topic. Um, and then we arrange them on a 2D uh, plane of 128 uh, by 128 uh, positions and we try to cluster them in a way that snippets that are on similar topics stay together and snippets that are very different on topic stay as far away from each other. Um, and then we say, okay, the word organ, for example, light up all the snippets after having distributed it on the map, light up every dot, so to say, where the word organ appeared in one of the snippets. And as a result, you have the, uh, so to say, most important feature of SDRs is that things that are similar look similar in their representation. And that's what you can actually see here. Uh, the word organ is even a special word because it has some obvious meanings, different meanings. Uh, but organ is something like a piano, very similar. And what you can see here is with the blue circle that there is an area on the representation where uh, piano and organ are similar, and that's basically because the aspect of being a keyboard kind of instrument uh, is true for both of them, and so they have a cluster that doesn't exactly look the same, but uh, it's on the same place and it's about the same size. In the same time, uh, organ uh, can be interpreted as being uh, important in the uh, sacred, I think we call it sacred music, um, therefore, it's played, uh, or there are many organs in churches and there are a specific kind of music that is played in churches. And you see that organ uh, and church also have an overlap, this time in a different region because it's a different topic. Uh, but organ contains also those uh, semantic aspects. And then you have, of course, organ uh, being an organ of the body, a part of the body. And compared to liver, uh, you can see that there is a third cluster um, that actually matches this aspect. And what this means is that every word, when you represent it as uh, a semantic fingerprint, exposes all the senses in relatively high resolution, because I have a lot of points available, uh, in uh, simultaneously. So you see the word organ, and you can immediately uh, deduct just from the representation that there are three or four uh, big meaning, different meanings that you have. Uh, I'm, okay. not, I'm not sure afterwards there's really a Q&A or not. Uh, I know. <laughs> I, I have very specific questions on the, like, why it's impossible to write really in a um, 2D uh, grid and also like, uh, not just on the, like, if you like, have an intermediate step on um, specifying the whole thing, so I hope I can... Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I will be here afterwards for very detailed question. I will try my best uh, to answer them uh, afterwards. Uh, but basically, specification is, a, is an important aspect because uh, we, as you will see, we uh, do actual calculations with these vectors. And uh, for example, if you OR a couple of those vectors together, um, it, it gets fuller and fuller, so to say. Uh, but that's another property, so to say, of the SDRs. Uh, you can actually sparsify them by counting how many pixels overlay uh, on every position and just take, let's say, the, the 
top 5% or something like that. And what is important is that with all those calculations and, and numeric manipulations, you don't lose information. Uh, and again, the brain, um, who supposedly works very similar to this, uh, is the best proof that you actually don't uh, lose information. Uh, maybe uh, the, the question why we have uh, chosen, chosen a, a 2D form of the vector, um, I have a good and a not so good answer to this. Uh, the, the one that I like most is the fact that it's basically um, a process that is carried out by the neocortex, which is itself a 2D sheet. Yeah? So if you look uh, at the logical structure of the neocortex, you find uh, so-called columns, little micromodules, and they are arranged as a, uh, as a 2D sheet, and they operate on the neighborhood, for example, by in inhibiting uh, columns that are just next to an active column and things like that. And this uh, directly, so to say, matches to the representation we have used here. We could have done the whole thing for three-dimensional vectors, um, but I don't think that we would have gained a lot. The smallest, uh, so to say, structure you can build that has an inside and an outside is a 2D triangle. Uh, and so it's sort of the most effective uh, way of doing this semantic folding process. That's the idea behind it, at least. Uh, so what do we do with these uh, fingerprints? Uh, we basically do one big fundamental function, which is calculate the similarity. And uh, um, calculation based on analogy is so to say, at least on a, on a philosophical level, there are more and more people thinking that you can basically solve most of our conceptual problems just based uh, on the concept of analogy. So what we do here <coughs> is basically um, to overlay the word cat and the word dog. And you see there are regions where there is a strong overlay, that's where cats and dogs are similar. They are both pets, they are both have a very similar biology, uh, but, for example, they eat different things, so they are also different in some aspects. And we have an overall um, overlap between the two representations of 38%, uh, which is much more than, uh, I don't know, cat and car would have 5% or something like that uh, in comparison. So the next interesting thing you can do with this representation is by taking an initial term, let's uh, say we take apple, and we then use the similarity uh, function to say, uh, show us from all the words the system knows, uh, which are the words with the closest matching uh, fingerprint representation, so with the biggest overlap to it. So uh, the, the most similar, so to say, fingerprint to the, to the fingerprint of the word apple is the fingerprint of the word computer. So the reason for that is because we took the information from Wikipedia and Wikipedia has a lot more to say about Apple computers than about Apple juice. Yeah? Uh, but th that's another aspect. By taking some different training material, we can, of course, change this uh, uh, implicitly. But I, I would think that this is very realistic in terms of uh, if you say Apple to an average person on the street, I'm pretty sure uh, in the meantime most of the people think about computers or iPhones or something like that. Uh, so, <clears throat> what we find out is that the most similar fingerprint to the word apple is the word computer, has a certain overlap. Now we say, from my apple fingerprint, I take away all the computer dots that I, that I have found there. I, I basically delete them out from my apple representation, and then I ask again, what is now the most similar fingerprint uh, uh, to my word, to the remainder of apple? And I find that it's the word fruit, which is like the second uh, most probable meaning that you have in this word. So I do the same thing again. I take all my fruit dots that are uh, also in my apple uh, representation. I take them away and I ask again what is now the most similar. And I get rock because obviously Apple has been a, rec a record company of Beatles and so on. Uh, so, again, in Wikipedia, this is the next most frequent uh, use case. Uh, what this shows you, and you can do this with any word, uh, what this means is that a very old, um, so to say, hard to solve problem of disambiguating words uh, can be solved purely computational 
as soon as you have converted the representation of the symbolic words into the uh, fingerprint uh, representation. You can do this with any uh, term. By the way, on our website, uh, you can play uh, a disambiguation game if you want and just type in any word and you will uh, be astonished how many meanings are behind basically every word. People say there are a lot of ambiguous words. I keep saying there are only ambiguous words, actually. Yes? Sorry, maybe it's a stupid question, but uh, what other specific dots stand for? So what for context. A context is a piece of text, an utterance, a statement, uh, a news message, any little thing that you can keep in your mind at once. And uh, every context contains a number of words. And for each of those words, this context is the context. This text is the context, so to say. So, so on Wikipedia, for example, the sentence would be... Uh, typically a little bit more. It's like two or three sentences, typically, that mm -hmm. express a certain concept. And so we have used, uh, uh, I would say, standard NLP techniques to cut uh, Wikipedia in little pieces so that we contain, uh, that, that we have one concept per context. That's, that's the goal. Of course, this is not perfect, but so that's what we try to do. Right? So, so you, you create observations, basically. Yeah, so yeah. Exactly. So uh, every dot is at least one context. It could be five contexts also, sometimes. It is because they overlay, exactly. So this was the disambiguation. What you can also do, uh, basically on the same concept, is that you can do computations with words. You can say, if I take all the Porsche away from Jaguar, what remains is something that's like a tiger. Yeah. Uh, so as you can see, uh, that's pretty much how we also sort of think from terminology very often, yeah? so that uh, every, every word contains uh, a, a little cloud of meanings and we can operate on these meanings. That's how we express things like humor or metaphors. Uh, that's basically by playing on this, on this unsharp clouds uh, behind words. So you say car, it would basically give you animal or tiger or whatever? Yeah, it gives. Then you might not get tiger, but you might get puma or uh, panther or something like that. So this is not, uh, this is not, uh, so to say, an exact uh, result in the sense. Uh, so for each kind of car you subtract from Jaguar, you might get a slightly different cat. Let's put it like that. Yeah? <laughs> but every human that looks at this immediately gets the gets the idea, and that's what 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 we try to 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 find. Yeah. So the next step is to take <coughs> uh, the fingerprints from the word level to the document level. So again, very naive, uh, we take uh, every word from a sentence, we convert each word in the sentence in a fingerprint, and then as we have SDRs, we are allowed to basically add them together. Then we do a respecification, by the way, because as you can see, uh, the result will become fuller and fuller, but still we can calculate it down to the 5% again, and we get an aggregated uh, fingerprint of my sentence. And now everything that I've said about the word fingerprints before is also true uh, for the sentence fingerprints, so you can actually compare them. So here you have two sentences, like uh, teens like playing good music with their mobile phones, and you can also consume chart hits with your notebook. So both sentences somehow speak about music and, and hearing music without actually sharing uh, any, any words, so to say. But you still see that you have 27% uh, overlap between the two sentences. So you have a direct measure finding out do those sentences uh, speak about something similar or not. If I would change the second sentence to the fishermen are sailing out of the harbor, which is, I would say, something very different. You immediately see it looks very different, and you only have 9% uh, remaining. Yes? How do you handle negations? So, uh, uh, the same sentence you used before, the 27% uh, overlap, if you add a not somewhere, it, it changes very little to nothing. 
So our computation here is purely on the lexical semantic side. Yeah? So we are only uh, um, looking at what concepts are in a piece of text and we are not trying to actually understand it in the sense of following a sentence and, and doing the grammar thing. So that will be um, the goal of our, so to say, uh, next level uh, that we are currently developing where we actually feed the output from our system into a neural network that is capable of learning sequences. And there we plan to actually learn and do the grammatical magic but uh, uh, will take some time. <laughs> uh, so uh, uh, yeah, by adding one word, even if the word like not would be a function word, so maybe in the in the slide before. No. In the slide before, what you can see is that the function words like two on there, uh, they look very evenly distributed. Yeah, so they occur so often in so many texts that whenever you bring them into an OR operation, they don't change a lot. They don't sort of create a new cluster or so. Whereas all the nouns and, and specific verbs, uh, they always have some structure. They have, it, it's a question of entropy that you have in the different the representations. Please. I can imagine that you take one phrase and use the same words and build a completely different meaning to the same words. Is the and it would give you the same, it would give you the same fingerprint, unfortunately, yes. right now. Okay. Yeah. Because it's, it, it only sees the bag of words, so whatever order they are, uh, but the fact mm -hmm. that, I don't know, a cat and mouse are together in a sentence, uh, tells you on the lexical side that most probably the mouse is actually a, a rat-like mouse and not a computer mouse. Yeah? So, so a sentence is still just a, a bag of words and not... Uh, At this level, yes. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. We are just worried about the aboutness of text and not yet uh, about the actual meaning, if you want, uh, of that is expressed. Please. Uh, would you probably stem words like to or on so that, that noise creates... So uh, what we try to do is to keep uh, the whole thing as minimalistic as possible. So we don't want it to do any artificial things. So we don't want it to stem, we don't want it to, make, to, to do stop word filtering because we said, okay, the algorithm has to be robust for this. Yeah? So, and as you see, uh, function words, just by looking at the fingerprint, you immediately see uh, that a function word is a function word, and you immediately realize that the effect on the final fingerprint is very marginal. So if you just drop the there and on and to out there, uh, it will not change the resulting fingerprint a lot. Yeah. Okay, so if I... One more question. Does okay. that mean weight the sentence vector? No. So that's what we try to do, is to really have uh, so to say, a flat uh, binary representation where I don't have to introduce any special case, any special treatment of any situation. Yeah? So, as I said, we do, we, even the word apple and the word apples would, be, would become the same by stemming, mm -hmm. but it's not true because whenever I say apple, it's an ambiguous word because it could mean my computer. When I say apples, there is no ambiguity because uh, apples will, in 99% of the case, be the fruit. Yeah? So by treating every morphological variant of a word as a word by itself, uh, gives you a much more authentic um, um, representation of what could be meant. Yeah? So a typical application of uh, fingerprinting plus being able to calculate the distance, respectively computing the similarities, that you can create a search engine with this. Uh, you have a document collection, you convert every document uh, in a fingerprint, and then you have a query that could be either an example document or you actually type in, I'm interested in dinosaurs, uh, whatever, uh, and you create a fingerprint of this, and then you have um, a very direct way of getting the result because you just compute the distance between your query fingerprint with every document and you have an intrinsic ranking already of the results, namely the, the distance, so to say, between the two. And even better, because, uh, for example, um, two people would 
uh, propose the same document as a, as a pattern, so to say. I'm looking for documents like this one, but one person is, let's say, an engineer and the other person is a lawyer, so they have different ways of looking at things. So they could bring in, let's say, each of them would be allowed to bring in two documents that are characteristic for what they are interested in. Uh, so you would get another fingerprint, namely one would bring in, let's say, some technical document with a technical fingerprint, the other would bring in some contracts, let's say, uh, where you get a fingerprint again. And now I take the comparison of query and documents uh, to select, let's say, the 100 most similar documents. So this is my result set. But the ranking of those 100 documents will now be made along with the distance to the profile fingerprint that the individuals brought in. So two people could cast the same query on the same uh, document collection, but would get different result sets or different results in a more general way depending on their interest. And that has been a sort of a holy grail in information retrieval for a couple uh, of years already. Um, here is the second prototypical use is a classifier. Um, as you might know, for example, for classification, uh, you can use things like support vector machines and uh, uh, other approaches where you have to bring in examples. So like uh, 10,000 examples for class A, 10,000 examples for class B, and then you have to train them. Uh, and then still you get only a certain percentage of, of precision in classifying. Uh, in our case, it's very simple. Uh, we create a fingerprint that stands for a class. So what we have been trying here, for example, um, is to differentiate between mammals and non-mammals. And the actual classification fingerprint, the thing that I use to decide if an animal belongs here or there, is created by actually taking the words mammal, mammals, and mammalian, and creating a fingerprint of those three terms. And then I can just compare it to all the animals, and I will realize that there is this area here in the fingerprint that whenever there are a lot of dots in there, then it tends to be a mammal. And whenever there are not so many dots in there, then it's typically not a mammal. And that's true for like 95% uh, of the animals. So, so it's like uh, uh, automatic te te generating text for... You could, you could use it to generate text, for example. Yeah? You could also go in the other direction and attach uh, tags to the fingerprints. So in the long list of all the fingerprints that we have created using Wikipedia, we could say for every word that is a location, give me a tag location on the fingerprint. And when I create um, a fingerprint after a certain operation, I could say on, or select only the, the, the bits that come from a location fingerprint. And like that, you could say, I don't know, I'm interested in that tree, but I only want to get uh, information relative to where this tree grows or something like that. Yeah? So there's a lot of room to, we, we are just scratching the surface of the approach. So you are, all of you are invited to do some experiments and let us know. <laughs> uh, but as I say, I mean, we are working with this now for three years. And I still have the impression every day I discover a new aspect to, to all of that. So normally I do the demos, but I suppose we uh, yeah. don't do them uh, <laughs> uh, due to, to time limitations. So maybe <clears throat> that uh, might be interesting uh, for you. We have done evaluations, of course, how good is this method in general. Um, and the, let's say, state of the art, there are some academic algorithms that do this uh, semantic similarity thing, uh, but they are very academic, means you cannot actually pipe like a terabyte of text through this, probably doesn't work. Uh, the only really robust uh, thing that can be used in, in, in larger projects or commercial context is uh, the Google Word Back uh, algorithm that some of you might have heard, uh, that basically takes a huge web corpus, I think, the, the official uh, corpus has something like 20 billion web pages that have been processed. And uh, what happens there is that for every word, the two words before and the two words after are used to create a context. 
So it's much shallower than what we do because we take real text pieces to become um, uh, the, the context. And uh, the, the word to back approach basically uh, makes the full cross combination and calculates, so to say, all the frequencies and based on that creates the statistics that then allow you to say what is similar to what. Um, but uh, as I said, uh, to, to have good results, to have these results, in fact, uh, you have to have the uh, Google corpus of about uh, 20 billion pages to be uh, trained in the corpus. We use 400,000 uh, Wikipedia pages, just to show you the, the comparison. And we, we need much less data, of course, because we take more data out of, of the training material. And the other thing is that we do this semantic folding, so we bring in the topology of the whole uh, universe uh, by uh, creating this 2D map, which also doesn't happen uh, with Google. But still, as you can see, uh, these are different uh, training sets, so Mantry-K, RG65, and so on. These are basically um, sets of word pairs, sentence pairs, and text pairs that have been scored by humans uh, on how close they are semantically. So, for example, the metric K, you have 3,000 uh, uh, pairs of words, and I don't know, a couple of thousand people probably uh, have manually scored one to five how close or distance two words are, and the algorithm has the goal to be as close to the human judgment as possible. So, for example, word to vec is able to uh, come up with 55% of the judgments similar to a human, uh, our retina makes 67% in this case. And what you see is that uh, our system outperforms not by 1 or 2%, but by, so to say, larger figures, which typically is an indicator that a completely different way of computation is used. Um, yeah. So less effort, uh, better results. And the other thing is that, in principle, we are more or less one order of magnitude faster than uh, the word to vec, uh, just due to the fact that we only deal with binary information instead of handling uh, floating point vectors. Yeah, so we are faster, we are better, and cooler. <laughs> OK. So just to give you a more business context, uh, we have uh, identified uh, what we call the disciplines, different areas of business usage of the functionality, uh, just to give you ideas on where you can use this. So you can, of course, search, you can locate documents, you can find web documents, you can match people. So whenever uh, I have text that describes a person, like your LinkedIn profile, for example, I can create a fingerprint of your LinkedIn profile, and of someone else's uh, LinkedIn profile, and by calculating the overlap, uh, I get a pretty good guess on how you two match, so to say. If it's a LinkedIn, it's, it's just, let's say, the professional matching. Uh, if it would be on Facebook, it can become more uh, private, like so to say. <laughs> Looks like Tinder. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, but matching can also be very professional, for example, if you want to match uh, job descriptions with uh, resumes of people. Yeah? So until now this has been a very complex uh, endeavor because you get in a resume of someone then you have to codify his skills so that it actually becomes matchable in your database. Uh, if you are one of the big uh, HR uh, brokers, so to say, you have to handle several thousand to hundred thousand profiles per day. Uh, you can imagine uh, how costly this is to do this uh, in a good quality by hand. So this might be an approach. Uh, you can find products, you can uh, take product descriptions, create a fingerprint, and like that do cross-selling, upselling uh, situations, give uh, hints to the buyer what else could be interesting. Uh, again, the alternative is catalog management, where you have to explicitly uh, state all the relationships between the products uh, what goes with what other product. Uh, here is a lot of potential for automation. Uh, of course, for discovery, to take uh, uh, huge uh, uh, scientific reports or scientific papers, huge collections, and just by 
searching with similarity, for example, uh, uh, finding, uh, let's say, something that has been relevant in agrochemistry that could be relevant in pharmacy just by changing the words, the words, but by keeping the same structure, so to say, of a process or something like that. So you have, with the similarity approach, you have a better chance of hitting those uh, two. And then you have, of course, uh, uh, all the adver uh, advertising on the internet uh, to basically propose uh, ads that actually fit with your interest and things like that. And last but not least, you have, of course, also the security domain so it's very nice to monitor what people are saying, even if it's not uh, matching in terms of vocabulary. So one thing that uh, was very interesting that we did practically was to take the Twitter feed, the, the fire hose, so all the tweets uh, that go through there. You can expect up to like 20,000 tweets a second. Um, and one thing that not even Twitter was actually able to do is to allow the user to say, I'm interested in mobile phones. I want to get every tweet that's somehow about mobile phones. Yeah. Yeah. So what you would need to do would be uh, taking, let's say, 100 keywords that cover the topic mobile phone. And for each message that comes in, you would have to check your 100 keywords with, let's say, each of the 10 words in the message. And all of that string matching, of course, and all of that 20,000 times a second. So you can uh, imagine uh, how expensive this becomes if you need to run a cluster for every cu customer uh, to do a, a, a sub-filtering, a content-based filtering uh, of the Twitter firehose. Uh, we have done an implementation uh, that actually, I can even show you, um, that, that runs on a very small, server and does this in real time, basically. And again, it's because we only uh, work with binary data. Oh, wrong demo. Unfortunately, my mouse pad is disintegrating. So what you see here, so no responsibility for the messages. This is unfiltered Twitter. Uh, it could be a lot of um, embarrassing stuff here. Uh, what you see is on the left side um, that uh, the 1% uh, tweet uh, stream, so to say, it's just 1%. Uh, and then you have expressions. I've uh, shown before that you can create expressions also uh, by saying uh, Jaguar minus Porsche, for example, if you want to denote uh, big cats. So this expression, lemonade and whiskey, basically, and the dots of the fingerprint of lemonade with the fingerprint of whiskey. Or finance and market is the intersection between the two fingerprints, finance and market. And as you can see, uh, even if, uh, so to say, the, the, uh, the tweets don't actually contain the expression keywords, they still uh, match pretty nicely uh, with the content. Yeah? And this can be done for hundreds of customers. Okay, so as usual, I'm taking a long time. Uh, so, but I think we pretty much made it because I told you already a lot of that. So just very shortly, uh, that's what I was uh, talking about, the, the, the comparing uh, profiles, um, or comparing products. And uh, by the way, the, 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 the slides uh, should be... Um, and then we will, we will upload the slides and then we could get more information. Yeah. So the, the rest is basically just to give you the three main arguments for using the technology. It's because it's very simple. You don't need to uh, worry about parsing, about uh, 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 sentence analysis or whatever complex NLP approach. You just send the API some text and you get the result back. So it's really easy to use. It's very efficient, so it's really fast, even if you want to uh, process uh, a couple of terabytes of text, uh, you can do this uh, in a reasonable time uh, using our functionality. And of course the quality by describing the meaning of stuff with a lot of uh, semantic aspects, uh, you get high quality, so to say, out of it. 
And that was it. Thank you, thank you.